try such a project, uh, this multi-year project on on uh, alternative, uh, on reinventing social emancipation? Probably uh, the reason is that I think we really need to reinvent social emancipation. Social emancipation is, is a very important idea of the Enlightenment, uh, is the idea that we aspire to a better society, to a more just society, to a society that frees us from the bondages of current uh, um, yeah, injustices and discriminations and uh, suppressions and marginalizations. And I have the impression that sometimes we have exhausted new ideas for social emancipation in the West, particularly in the Western countries. And therefore, uh, when I look around in my, in my research, I have been uh, doing research in Africa, in Latin America and in Asia, I see that the world is full of innovations. There are alternatives, there are uh, people doing things, not just for survival, but social innovations that are not very well known because they are not within the script or the canon of the social sciences. As we know, the social sciences were developed in the Western countries, probably no more than, no more than five countries originally, uh, from uh, the, the Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and uh, later on the United States. And the realities of the world, particular countries that are becoming more and more important in economic and political terms, like India, like South Africa, like Brazil, like China, like many other countries, they have their own ideas, they have their own forms, and they are not very well known. So this project aims at uh, accounting for the diversity of the world, mm -hmm. for the immense social and political innovation that exists in the world, and also to make known uh, uh, other social scientists, young social scientists, some of them first class, but because they are based in India or in South Africa or in Brazil, they are not very well known, or in Mozambique, which is another country which I have included in this project, they are not known. So my project is to bring in more people, more knowledges, more ideas, more concepts, more styles of writing in the social sciences about the world, and by doing so, I think that we renovate also the social sciences as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really about going beyond the, the, the Western paradigm, the Western canons, and so at the same mm -hmm. time, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intellectual project, it's a, it's, a, it's a political project, and it's a way to be uh, an activist in these two areas, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, Jean-Marc, when we uh, step a little bit outside the West, we can see that, in fact, social scientists, scientists in particular, they are very committed to the social problems of their country. The social problems are so acute, are so present. They knock at the doors of the universities and the research centers. People are not really isolated in ivory towers. And therefore, we cannot make this uh, very clear distinction between knowledge on one side and politics on the other side. I think that social scientists more and more around the world feel that they are socially responsible for their countries, for the, the, the fate of people that are oppressed, discriminated against, are impoverished, are silenced, and they would like to give voice to these people. So there is a sense of social and political responsibility, and uh, uh, this, I think, brings together new kinds of knowledge and new kinds of politics. Mm -hmm. And the two things go together. Of course, I'm not conflating knowledge and politics. They are two very different areas, but they communicate. They feed on each other. They can be enriched by each other. And when we are accounting, for instance, in this project, for new innovations in local democracy, or in cooperatives, or in multicultural projects around the world, what we are doing is, on one side, provide new knowledge about these realities. On the other side, empowering people to conduct struggles based on that knowledge, because they know that in different parts of the world, more people really are having the same ideas or similar ideas, fighting against the same social injustices, uh, struggling for the end of discrimination, be it gender, racial, caste discrimination. So we have a, a kind of common struggles, but people don't communicate, they don't know each other. So we, we need to bring encounters, we need to make meeting points 
And I think my project, as I see it, is one among the many meeting points that we can uh, provide for, for the younger generations, in my view, both in terms of knowledge production and reinventing of politics. You, 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 you just said something, you, know, you mentioned that in your view, uh, scholars, academics in the non-Western world, in, in Africa, in, in Latin America, in Asia, are more um, uh, aware of the demands uh, of, of social responsibility than in the West, partly because in the West, uh, uh, as you just said, academics are the, the, the captive of their wealth, in, your, in, in a way, of, of the ivory tower. Can you tell us more about this, because this is an interesting idea. Well, it is so the development of the social science in, sense in, in the West. Uh, in fact, they were addressing in the 19th century, of course, uh, the social questions in the West, and they were also very much involved uh, with the social questions and with the problems. But then, uh, our social sciences and our knowledge at our universities got too professionalized. And when they became professions, they lost contact with the struggles of the people. And then the, the social scientists, instead of writing, having in mind the struggles of the people, they have to write, having in mind, the referees, the referees of the journals. And the referees of the journals are usually, usually very narrow-minded people. Uh, they also uh, resent against innovation. And in fact, the universities became very elitistic in their, in their uh, uh, structure. This has been uh, 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 as I said, the tradition in the West in the last 40, 50 years, things are changing because, you know, now I'm in Italy and, uh, and, and you know, as you said, I'm originally Port from Portugal. What we see these days in the squares and the streets of Greece, of Portugal, of Italy, or of Spain, the people are knocking at our doors. I mean, the, the people are really in social turmoil because of the financial crisis and economic crisis. So the demands of society are more and more present at our universities, at our research centers. So I think that the ivory tower, which has been uh, very common in the West, even in the United States, for instance, uh, I could give you an example from medicine, from Wisconsin. As you know, in medicine there has been a very interesting social struggle going on for uh, some time, and it means that the social sciences, the universities, cannot isolate it itself, themselves from the social struggles. And we can see that as well in the West. So it's interesting because you are telling us that the, the, the professionalization of ideas uh, leads to two things, one, one which can be good and one which can be bad. I mean, the, the, the professionalization of ideas on the one hand, you know, allows to the deepening of knowledge, of science, but on the other hand, it separates uh, this knowledge from social concerns and in the process it undermines the, the ability of knowledge to be perhaps uh, um, good and, and socially useful, right? You know, that, that's precisely the, the dilemma, in a sense of the paradox. In fact, the great social scientist, Max Weber, uh, already mentioned that at the beginning of the 20th century, that the development of science and of bureaucracies that would go together with professionalization of society would produce the, the disenchantment of the world. Mm -hmm. So the people get disenchanted, and therefore we need to uh, re-enchant the world. Because if you want to change the world for the better, we need passion, we need utopia, you need the new ideas for uh, reinventing, as I said, uh, social emancipation. So you need re-enchanting, and the re-enchanting of the world involves a new meeting point between science and between and politics and culture. I think the th three of them have to be brought together in order to re-enchant the world, I would say. And, and in fact, you're, you're thinking about uh, uh, progressive knowledge and uh, about the progressive agenda is also very much about finding ways to better organize uh, and mm -hmm. produce knowledge. Yeah, I think that on one side, we, 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 there are new ways of production of knowledge that are needed. I think that more and more, we need more collective forms of knowledge. Uh, and also a plurality of knowledge, what I call ecology of knowledge. For instance, in the West, we have given absolute privilege to science and to scientific knowledge, but we know that science is very limited. 
And science is very important for certain purposes, but not for all purposes. Because if I want to go to the moon, I need science and technology. But if I want to protect biodiversity, I need indigenous knowledge. So I need other kinds of knowledges. And in our world, particularly in the West, we have been in fact destroying, neglecting other forms of knowledge. But if you look at the world as your unit of analysis, and we are at the United Nations, we can see that four-fifths of the population of the world, in their everyday life, they don't rely on scientific knowledge. They rely on common knowledge, on popular knowledge, or on peasant knowledge, on traditional knowledge. And we have, in fact, silenced all this knowledge. We have not given value to these knowledges. So my project aims at the kind of ecology of knowledge again, a meeting point of different knowledge. Some of them are very incommensurable, of, of course, peasant knowledge and scientific knowledge, but we have to respect both for different purposes. Uh, if you have this crisis in the world, then we want to solve them. Yeah, no, no, no. So, and, and so as I, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the research project on which we are focusing today as part of this conversation on, on global justice is made of five uh, volumes, five very thick uh, volumes. I have some of them here. And so if it is okay with you, let us review quickly each of the volumes to give uh, the audience uh, a flavor uh, of your thinking and, and uh, that of your colleagues. So the, the, the first volume is entitled Democratizing Democracy Beyond the, the, the Liberal Canon. Of course, since you give the title Democratizing Democracy to this volume, I guess that you mean that there is a need to democratizing democracy. So, tell us a bit about this. Yeah, you know, there is, even in the West, there is a very, very rich tradition of different models of the democracy, of different conceptions of democracy. But in the last 30 years, we have given exclusive priority to the representative democracy. And that is to say, to the, the, a model of democracy in which the citizens don't decide the issues, they simply elect the decision makers uh, of our society. And representative democracy is, of course, a great advancement of, of our world and should be praised for that. But it is not the only model, and in fact, it's sometimes a very weak model of democracy. What I call is a model of democracy of low intensity, because people in Sometimes they vote for different parties, but first, there is not much of an alternative among the parties. Uh, secondly, the parties violate their programs very often, and we see this weakness. For instance, uh, just take, since I'm in Venice, I'll, I'll just mention Europe. And, and, you know, the citizens of Europe, you know, by far in 2003, voted against the invasion of Iraq. Uh, but in fact, their governments, which have been elected by them, all of them were in favor of the invasion. So you can see a crisis of representation. The citizens don't see themselves represented by their representatives. So this is not to say that uh, democracy, representative democracy is not valid, but we have to enrich it with other forms of democracy. And in the, my book and this project, we have forms of participatory democracy, particularly at local level. And there are immense innovations, particularly in, uh, in Latin America and also in Asia. We see emerging forms of local democracy. There sometimes are what we call participatory or liberative democracy. Sometimes it's communitarian democracy. For instance, the constitution of the Bolivia tells us that there are three models of democracy equally valid in the Republic of Bolivia. Representative democracy, participative democracy, or participatory democracy, and communitarian democracy. That is to say, the democracy that is prevalent among the indigenous people. In Africa, in the rural areas, and sometimes in urban areas, we see also forms of communitarian democracy taking place. So the idea is to broaden the canon of what counts as democracy. It's not just representative democracy. There are other forms of democracy, and they can complement each other. They don't conflict necessarily. They may complement each other. And this complementation is what I call democratizing democracy as one dimension. The other one, of course, is that for some reason, uh, Jean-Marc, we have uh, reduced our democratic uh, discussions to the public sphere. 
But I think there is no need to restrict ourselves to the, to, to, the, to the public sphere. We should have democracy in the families. We should have democracy in the communities. We should have the, uh, democracy in our uh, enterprises, in our offices. Democracy is something that should be cultivated everywhere and in every place, in different forms, of course. But there is no need uh, to restrict democracy to the public sphere. Hmm. Uh, to, to go back to the crisis of political representation uh, uh -huh. and, and, and your expression uh, uh, democracy of low intensity is, is a very nicely way to, to coin the, 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 this crisis uh, this mm. crisis is, is at work in your view both in developed countries and in developing countries and is it something which is recent or is it something which has been uh, uh, at work for, for, for many years no, it's, it's, it's getting worse. I mean, in my analysis, in my studies, I can see that this uh, low intensity is, is becoming even lower intensity for two reasons. Uh, one, in fact, is that uh, particularly when neoliberalism became uh, the main form of capitalism and globalized itself, uh, this global capitalism is, uh, uh, tries to avoid democratic deliberation. You know, you see very often that uh, structural adjustment, uh, conditionalities violate the local constitutions of different countries. We see that now in Greece, or you see that now in Ireland or in Portugal at this present time. So you can see that democratic uh, realm, which is nationally based, is being besieged by international constraints that violate their democracy. In second place, corruption is growing. And why it is growing? Because uh, in the liberal political theory, there has always been a distinction between, between two very important markets. The political market of ideas and the economic market of services and goods. The first market has, is dominated by values that have no price. The second uh, uh, market is the market of values that have a price tag. That is to say, can be sold, they can be bought. What we see today is that the economic market has contaminated the political market. And therefore politicians uh, sell their votes by being bought by economic powerful interests. And therefore there is a fusion, a contamination between economic power and political power. Sometimes is illegal as corruption, sometimes it's not even illegal. Lobbying, for instance, may be very legal, but is a form of contaminating the political realm through economic power. And if all economic interests were equally organized, that would be fine, as Rousseau used to say. The problem is that some interests are much better organized than other interests. And this destroys or distorts the political game, the political democracy. And I see this tendency as growing. And therefore, we go from low intensity to lowest intensity very often. And that's why we need to renovate and to uh, uh, refurbish our democratic ideals and practices. And in fact, the, fa the fact that the economic market with the values which have a price is dominating and polluting the political market, which at, at heart is about, in principle at least, uh, uh, the, the, the value, um, uh, I mean, it's about values which, which have no price is of course a problem, because values which have no price are in fact, you know, the most precious because it's about organizing, negotiating freedom, equality, uh, justice, and so on. That's right. Yeah. That's right. In our opinions, I mean, the political ideals, the, the, the ideologies, the, the options, I mean, they are not for sale. I, I have, a, I have a given, a, I have a given ideology, we have another one, we respect each other, but we are not going to make transaction, an economic transaction on that basis, yeah. because they are priceless. They are yeah. priceless. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, in politics these days, we see that more and more the values of ideology are being subjected to economic prices. <laughs> As I said, this is corruption in a sense. Now, actually, the, the, the paradox and the interesting thing is that priceless things are in fact the most uh, valuable things. Absolutely. And that's why I'm going to put a price on them. Uh, uh, on, on, on the second aspect, uh, uh, alternative forms of uh, 
uh, of democracy and it's essentially at the local level. How do you, uh, how do you um, uh, dovetail, you know, formal forms of democracies and the local forms of democracy? I mean, can they complement one another? I mean, uh, can they work together? Yeah, they can work together. It's, it's a complex issue because we have here a kind of a scale problem because there are forms of democratic deliberation that take place at, at the national level or sometimes at the international level, let's take the, the General Assembly, uh, and then there are other forms that need a more local context, a more local scale for uh, assemblies that in fact deliberate on concrete issues. But in some countries, you can see already the complementation of these different scales. And that is to say, if you unite different locales, different local dimensions, municipalities, you can reach to an higher stage, which is, for instance, sometimes a state like in Brazil. For instance, in Brazil, in Rio Grande do Sul, we have already participatory budgeting at the state level, not just the city, at the level of the state. And there are proposals to bring it to the level of the federation of the Union, because Brazil is a, a federative republic, and therefore there is an attempt to bring together, to solve the problem of scale, as we call it. Mm -hmm. and, and then, uh, as you just mentioned, the, 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 the third dimension is uh, democracy beyond the politics, uh, within the, 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 the realm of, for instance, privacy within the family and so on. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's important to really not view democracy as simply, uh, you know, uh, to be uh, pursued uh, in the political context, but also to be pursued, conceived of an exercise, you know, uh, in the family and so on? Democracy has to be a culture, you know, Jamar, because for us, for most people in the world, uh, the, the democratic uh, exercise in the political realm is just a fraction of their lives. I mean, they vote every four years or every two years, and of course they read the newspaper and uh, they may be, pay attention to the political discussions, but their lives, you know, most of their time in their lives is spent in their factories, in their employers, with employers, in their families, in the communities. And we see lots of discriminations, lots of silences, lots, I would say, even of despotisms going on. For instance, in employment today, we see everywhere the erosion of the, the rights of workers. Uh, what we used to call labor law, labor law was a magnificent body of, of, of legislation that wanted to protect the weaker part in the labor contracts, usually the employee, that is to say the worker. Well, we see today, even in Europe, but we see everywhere, a kind of a, ten a, ten a tendency to erode these rights. So if they are eroded, then the weaker part, the employee, the worker, is in a very weak position vis-a-vis -vis the employer and therefore is not in a democratic context. In fact, it's very despotic context. Mm -hmm. We go to India and we see bonded workers. We, we have the, in the United Nations a department on slave-like labor. So there are many people that have no real experience of democracy, even though they live in democratic countries. Mm -hmm. So my idea is that we ex have to expand the experience of democracy as a culture of conviviality, of sociability. That's basically the idea. Yeah, yeah. And, and then what about the, 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 the highest level? I mean, uh, in, uh, the, what about global democracy? I mean, how, because, I mean, uh, clearly, you know, since you are now living in a world where societies are more and more intertwined, interdependent, and so on, and interacting, I guess, I mean, do we need uh, to democratize the, 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 the global levels of governance? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's probably the most difficult. I, quite frankly, today, looking at the world, sometimes one aspires that we should be heading for a a global civil society and a global political community. But sometimes it looks like we are heading for a global civil war, not a global civil society. So you are at a time in which we have to have very decisive decisions on the ways in which the countries are going to respect each other and uh, the peoples in the different countries are going to respect each other. And of course the United Nations, you know that we need a profound, probably still today, a profound reform of the United Nations that in my view 
would be the beacon or a, of a, a very of a stronger uh, democracy, not just among the states, but uh, among the peoples, among the organizations in the world. Because what we see today is that there is, there is an old world that people don't like, which is the world of imperialism. But still we have today many strong states that are imposing their will on, on the world. And you, you see today, for instance, in the reality as I see it, the reality from which I speak today is the reality in which we have what we call the markets, that is to say the rating agencies that have not been elected but downgrade the credit of Italy or of Spain or of France or of, of Ireland and by doing so they degrade immediately the social expectations of the people. This is not democracy because this is in fact despotism because nobody has elected these agencies to tell us uh, our situation so we need more democratic accounting. And in fact, in Europe, we are discussing new forms, for instance, of regulation of the capital markets, particular financial markets, to bring them under democratic deliberation. So if you ask me today about the ways of increasing democracy at the global level, the first thing that comes to mind is, please, regulate the financial markets. Mm -hmm. Because without regulation of the financial markets, most countries are at the mercy of speculation that may destroy the lives of people. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a chance that it will happen? One wonders. It is happening, my dear. I think I, I'm really afraid of, of the things because we never imagine that, for instance, these ideas of stru structural adjustment that we have seen that caused so much uh, suffering in Tanzania or in Mozambique or Indonesia would come to Europe. But here they are, the same conditionalities and the same suffering. And in fact, in our economies, we cannot say, there are problems, of course, but the problems cannot be solved by, by, by financial speculation. They have to be solved by political deliberation. So in this case, we are uh, showing the relationship between the political realm and the economic realm. And that's why, as you were referring to my books, the second topic is on the economy. Because I think that we cannot move on to a stronger form of democratic rule with our other alternative economies. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if the second book on, on my project is because uh, about all these other forms of economic activity that are taking place in the world, and some of them, they have not a capitalist logic. They are not based on infinite uh, accumulation. They are based on reciprocity, on the well-being, on a different relationship with nature, on the idea that of community enrichment. They are cooperatives, they are popular economic organizations throughout the world, and they are not very uh, praised by us. They are not even known anywhere. Or people think that, well, they are residual. But they are not residual, they are very important. No, no, precisely so the, the second volume of this uh, huge intellectual enterprise is entitled Another Production is Possible Beyond the Capitalist Canon and it's clearly uh, a very uh, a systematic criticism of capitalism and of its economic and, and social uh, uh, modalities and, and so you, you, as you just mentioned, you, you, as a way to really go the other way, you call for what you call, uh, you, you call for what you name um, solidarity economy and, and, and social economy based on uh, reciprocity and mutuality. So tell us a bit about, uh, tell us more about, about this. Well, I think there are things that uh, for, a, for a long time they have been uh, uh, taking place at, at the low level, at the grassroots level in different countries, these forms of organization, very often as kind of peasants uh, uh, economies and so on. But today, you find them in the constitutions of the countries. For instance, in Ecuador and in Bolivia, uh, they say that the model of economic development for their country is, uh, is a catch-up concept, in fact, is called summa causa. This concept uh, means uh, uh, good life, living well. And living well is not living by accumulating wealth, it's by respecting nature, it's by respecting uh, the possibilities of the collective growth of the, of the communities, reciprocity and mutuality. And they are already establishing that constitution. 
For instance, they, if they go ahead, they will have an impact on the extraction of, uh, of uh, minerals and of natural resources because they have to be they have to respect the territories of indigenous people because they are sacred territories they are not just natural resources so they have a different concept of spirituality in nature for instance and not for us because the a capitalist agriculture for instance now for biofuels is do what we call the land grabbing uh, that is to say, buying huge tracts of land to uh, produce uh, jatrof or produce uh, sugar, cane, uh, sugar cane for biofuels. And this destroys the ecological equilibrium, destroys the peasants' economies. Many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands, Jamar, of peasants throughout Africa and Latin America are being displaced because of these acquisitions of land as a kind of a capitalist agriculture. So I'm counterposing to the capitalist agriculture, these are the peasant and solidarity agriculture and other forms of economy. Mm -hmm. And I think the struggle is there for other forms of economy because capitalist economy, as it stands now, not only produces huge injustices in the world, but also ecological degradation, destruction of the planet. And this is a very serious problem, and we should address it and start addressing it. Mm -hmm. And one way of addressing it is by alternatives to development, new forms of dealing with nature, with our communities that are raised for an equilibrium, a global equilibrium of things that keep our planet, uh, in a sense, intact for the future generations. Because I think we are destroying the possibilities that the future generations enjoy the planet as we are enjoying it at this point, already with problems because of global warming and because of, 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 of all the questions that we know. But but this uh, this models of, of solidarity economy or, and of social economy, I mean, they, uh, we, we talk about them uh, in the European context. They are, I think, quite influential in in Latin America. But what is the impact in the U.S., which is so committed to capitalism? What is also the impact in Asia, which is all about you know growth and development and uh, the, the the you know the, the the economic miracle of China and so on? And what is the impact in Africa, where clearly you know the problems are are enormous. I mean, what is the scope of the impact mm -hmm. of these uh, uh, alternative models of, of economy? Well, the impact is, is really a struggle going on and is more acute today than when I start the, the, my project. Yes. Because at this point, for instance, in India, we see a very, very nasty struggle going on and sometimes very violent between mm -hmm. peasants and, and the mega projects uh, uh, organizers, particularly in agriculture or can be also other types of development. We see that the same in China. We see already the displacement of peasants that is really destroying their ways of life, which at this point seems not to be a problem because China is really with a staggering growth and therefore it looks like the cities can absorb all these multitudes of people that are being displaced from the countryside. But suppose that there is a crisis in this development. All the countries that have the type of growth that China had, they stopped at a given point in time. Like the United States, like Europe today, we don't grow at this point uh, at the same level than China or Brazil or Argentina. So what happens to this? So you can, you, uh, can have in for a major social crisis. And I think that in, in, in Africa, the social crisis is going to be tremendous because uh, Africa is, has been so uh, discriminated by the neoliberal policies in which, in fact, most of the negative aspects of, of, global, of uh, neoliberal globalization have a direct impact in, in Africa. That's why in Africa we have nuclear waste today. You know, they have no, no nuclear power plants but they are the deposits of the nuclear waste, the nuclear waste of the developed countries because they get some money out of that. So this is very unjust because we know that that nuclear waste is dangerous for the populations, but they are hosting it uh, as deposits because they need the money and they, they need the contracts. So this injustice 
particularly now, if we are going to destroy these forms of agriculture, the peasant agriculture, in the name of the, the, the monoculture of biofuels, they, which also are very thirsty, they consume all the water that is already being a problem in Africa, we have to invent new rights, rights to land, right to water. Uh, yeah, there are things that ch cannot be privatized. I mean, you have now in the constitutions of Argentina, of Uruguay, and the constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia, the constitutional principle that people have a right to water, and therefore water cannot be privatized. Mm -hmm. But we know that it is being privatized. Mm -hmm. And we know that there is a danger for the populations, for the population that cannot afford, in fact, to buy water which sometimes become very expensive and we have major crises as we had in South Africa when they privatize in some areas the potable water, drinking water and then the people could not buy the bill and the government just turned off the, 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 the tap and there was no water for the people and the state had to come in and say well look, people need to drink water every day so these ideas of solidarity of, of uh, common goods of humankind. That's what we have to struggle, and the United Nations should be crucial on these uh, declarations that we have been fought, uh, fighting for, the declaration of the common goods of humankind. And these common goods are water, for instance. And land should also be one of those. And clean air should be another one. So this is the alternative forms of production that, you are right, at this point they seem to be very marginal to capitalism. But we are re reinventing social emancipation. That is to say, we are developing intellectual tools, political tools, in the name of the future. Because we see that if you don't change this, we are heading for disaster. Yeah. For a major disaster. And, and, and you are right, you know, we, we have to deal with this kind of tension. On the one hand, you know, we, we, we see that China, I mean, the, the emerging countries, China, Brazil, India, and so on, are really uh, taking off, but based on capitalist uh, practices and ideology. And on the other hand, you know, the UN agenda is partly about trying to really preserve and create spaces for so for priceless common goods. So, how do you conceptualize the tension? How do you negotiate the tensions? And how do you find a middle ground? Yeah, that, that's a very important question, and I think that in order to solve that question we need different kinds of knowledge. We have to respect the other in a more intercultural way. And in a sense, your question already leads me to the third topic on interculturality and rival knowledges. That is to say, if we don't respect other ways of being, other ways of understanding of the world, we never get there. That is to say, but I usually say that the understanding of the world by far exceeds the Western understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. There are other non-Western ways of looking at reality, of looking at nature, of having different conceptions. So in order to develop a common understanding, we have to know more about this diversity of the world. And therefore we need a more intercultural type of knowledge. Between scientific knowledge on one side, which is very respectful and very important, but other kinds of knowledge, they have to be protected, because these are the knowledges by which most of the population still live today. And we very often discredit their knowledges, but there is nothing in their place. If you take Africa today, if you, please don't, don't go to Africa and say that you know, modern medicine will solve all the health problems in Africa, because more than 90% of the population have no access to modern medicine. There are other medicines, traditional medicines, and now the World Health Organization recognizes the role and the value of traditional medicines. So we need a more intercultural understanding of the world, because the alternative to this intercultural understanding is war, is the clash of civilizations. And I don't want that. That's a political view. I want a dialogue. But the dialogue in horizontal terms. It's not that I impose my single criteria of universalism that we do very often. We talk about universal human rights in a very reasonable way because sometimes they are very Western and don't respect other conceptions of human rights or 
human dignity, they feel to respect other knowledges, other conceptions. Not because everything goes or everything has the same value, but we have to understand our differences and respect more our differences. There is no other way other than this in order to avoid a kind of a global war and among you know, different paradigms with much destruction of human lives, needless. Uh, destruction of human rights. You know. and, and this is very much at the core of this third volume, as you mentioned, is, which is entitled A Northern Knowledge is Possible Beyond Northern Ep Epistemologies. And so, as you mentioned, you know, what is key for you is to re and, and your colleagues is to really try to understand the other as a way to better see and understand ourselves. And I think that the underlying uh, political agenda, which is also an intellectual agenda, is I think, you know, how do we conceive what is right and pursue what is right without being self-righteous? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, that is to say, we have to have a sense of humility, mm -hmm. a sense that, uh, as a very important German philosopher once said, that we have to be learned ignorance, in a sense, I have to consider myself that my knowledge is very relative. I don't know, social sciences don't allow me to know everything. So I am ignorant of other knowledges. Knowledges are incomplete, and all cultures are also incomplete and problematic. And that's why we need a dialogue among them. But a dialogue in their own terms. I mean, I cannot, in fact, impose my terms to the other. I have to respect. I cannot just say, well, you have to defend human rights. Human rights have to be a culture that comes from within, not imposed from the outside. So we need to create that as a, not just as I am the deposit of truth or of rightness, of the only valid ethics. I'm really prepared to risk that what I consider right may be considered wrong by some, uh, uh, someone else. And I may have to argue things that are obvious to me, but I have to argue with them to make sure that my reasons are understood by him or her and that, that I understand their reasons. So this mutual understanding uh, requires an intercultural conception of human dignity. Uh, the idea that self-respect requires that for me and for you probably it's very clear the individual is the most important thing. In other cultures, this community is the most important thing. Let's discuss that because we have problems if we emphasize just individualities, but we have problems if we emphasize only the community. So let's have a discussion about different conceptions. And this, in my view, as I say, is the only alternative to war. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it's the ability to listen, but also what you are saying, it uh, calls for somehow reinventing the, 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 the way we understand and, and, and uh, practice uh, learning and teaching. That's precisely. And I, see, I think that much of the important knowledge that goes on in the world today takes place outside our universities our research centers, our universities, as we were discussing in the beginning with the idea of the Ivory Tower, our universities have really kept uh, themselves isolated from other knowledge that exists around us. Sometimes universities are right at the center of the city and they know nothing about what the people think just across the street. So I think that we have to open our universities, we have to change our education system, uh, as a matter of fact, I see the dominant tendency goes in the other direction. Make it more professional, more elitistic, global universities, franchising of knowledge, of really packaged knowledge. This is a disaster, Jamal. This is the end of the university as we know it. We need critical knowledge. We need more intercultural knowledge. We need to open ourselves to different forms of understanding and of knowing reality. That's at least my, my idea. Yeah, no, no, you, you just mentioned the expression of franch franchising of knowledge. So how do we go about this? I mean, you know, um, you don't think that it's the way to go. So w what is the problem with this and how do we create uh, uh, alternatives uh, alternative models of, of uh, production of knowledge and of dissemination of knowledge? 
Well, Jamal, the first initiative that we could do it to, in my view, in my case, is just to fight against the next round of the WTO, because as you know, the first, the, the round that is now to be discussed is the, the liberalization of services, within which education is one of the 12 services that, is, that it is going to be liberalized. And what is the most important, most profitable area of services in education is what the World Bank call the tertiary education, which is basically university education. And if these services are going to liberalize, then a few global universities, Oxford or Harvard or Yale, which is my university, they can sell courses around the world. They can sell packages of programs around the world. And as you can imagine, they may be excellent. I was trained in an excellent university, but that university reflects the realities of the United States, not the realities of Bangladesh, not the realities of China, not the realities of other countries. So we need, in fact, to struggle against this idea of franchising global knowledge and selling it throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And we have to have more knowledge from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. from the, the needs of the people. And the universities, in fact, uh, when they were created, at the core of the university was a national project. Okay. Look at the, the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, or the University uh, Nehru in New Delhi. They are the universities around which the idea of the nation was created. Mm -hmm. The political project of the nation or in the world mundial in Mozambique, or Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. These are universities that, in a sense, created the national project. Mm -hmm. If we are going to the franchising knowledge, these national projects, or that is to say, this uh, diversity of the world disappears, becomes invisible. That's my concern. Yeah, and, and so, you know, so, so it's, it's, so it's, it's, an, it's a very important issue. So what kind of... Uh, 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 Institutions of, of knowledge of, of uh, regarding teaching and research should be organized for the future because on the one hand we have we have these global universities which are about uh, uh, French uh, about you know selling uh, uh, a particular form of knowledge at the global level and then we have the the, the, the national universities uh, which are being disqualified and partly of also not entirely adapted to the you know mm -hmm. current evolution of the world so what what should be the way in terms of uh, inventing the, 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 the new forms of institutionalization of research and te teaching for tomorrow. I mean, I guess it has to be a combination um, of inventions at the local level and at the global level, but what would be the way? Well, I think I'm in front of the solution, uh, Jean-Marc. I think the, the, uh, the, the, the university, the United Nations University, could be a good starting point for cooperations, non-commercial cooperation among universities around the world. Because what we need is in fact a non-commercial cooperation. I, I'm all in favor of cooperation, international cooperation. You know that in the Middle Ages the universities were very transnational. The professors that taught here in Venice or in Bologna would teach also in Paris or in Coimbra in my university. So they were transnational. We need more non-commercial interaction in more non-commercial cooperation among universities and knowledges. And the United Nations University, if it is reformed in a way of giving voice to this diversity of university projects around the world, my dear, this would be tremendous. It would be a great alternative to the commercialization of knowledge that is now underway. Yeah. So, but no, and, and in fact, also, I mean, it could be used as a as a forum to precisely bring to the to to the tables of global policy, global thinking, a variety of intellectual and cultural traditions to think about global issues, bring together the local, the national, and 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 the global, right? Absolutely, I'm I'm absolutely in agreement with you. That would be the that would be the, the way to do things. Yeah, but, but, and that's partly what we're trying to do uh, in the context of this conversation series on, on global justice, bring, pe bring people from, from around the world and from a variety of disciplines. The fourth volume, uh, uh, Professor de Souza, is about uh, uh, voices of the world. So why did you feel it was important to really feature uh, uh, voices themselves? Look, it's about, it's, it's about uh, personal stories. 
And so, That's right. Yes, and, and the idea is that beyond ideas, you have human beings, you have personal trajectories. Precisely, Jean-Marc. I mean, it's to be consistent to the ideas that I developed in the previous volumes, in which the key concept is ecology of knowledge, is that I came to the conclusion that the knowledges of the social scientists in the previous uh, volumes, no matter how diverse they are, they are still scientific knowledges. And they are discussing the, 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 the social movements. So in that final volume, in the fourth volume, we give the voice to the leaders of the social movements. So you have leaders, we have traditional healers, we have leaders of landless movement, we have uh, leaders of national liberation in South Africa, we have Gandhian leaders in India, we have even a trade uh, union uh, leader in China of independent uh, uh, trade unionism that is emerging. So you have the voices of these people through very long interviews, some of them took hours and hours, in which there is a kind of an oral history of these leaders, how they came about to be what they are, how, what kinds of knowledge they resort to, what kind of experiences, and this is a different book. They are really different voices of the world, and it's marvelous, Jamar, to see how put together the voices from two indigenous leaders in, uh, in, uh, in Colombia, together with two traditional leaders in Mozambique or two women leader of social movements in South Africa. They have fabulous diversity of experiences and this is the diversity that we need more because it is there but we don't have the instruments. Our forum, this forum, unfortunately, is quite rare. Yes. So it's very difficult to, to find fora where this diversity can be talked about, can be made visible, and people can go and buy the books, sell the books, see this diversity and go to the ground and really value the diversity of the world. Unfortunately, with all the media that we have, uh, we don't have more diversity. We have less diversity. Yeah. And, and precisely in this uh, diversity that you try to feature in this book, do you find common traits? Do you find commonalities? I mean... Uh, I see a commonality. I mean, I see that people have different languages uh, to speak about social emancipation. The title of the project, in fact, uh, is now limited because it should be used in the plural. Not social emancipation, but social emancipations in the plural. Because, in fact, there is not a single conception of emancipation. What I've seen is that people, in fact, have a sense of dignity, individual and collective dignity and struggle for a society that allows for that dignity to flourish. So the idea of a better society, of a more just society, which for many has to be a collective well-being, not individual well-being. I mean, for, for them it's, it's absolutely evil if, you know, a, a, a leader of a hedge fund makes those millions of, of dollars while a family has, would take thousands of years to make that money, the money that he makes in one year. I mean, this is absolutely injustice, in, uh, unjust in certain contexts. Even in our context, I would say this is unjust. So we have different concepts of people that are struggling for a better society, and also not just in economic terms, but in cultural terms, more cultural justice, and environmental justice as well. Different conceptions of the nature. For the indigenous people, nature is not a natural resource. Is the mother earth, is the well-being, is the living being from which all our being comes and originates. This is quite important for the world, not just for the indigenous people, for the world in general to have this conception when we are so concerned about the environmental issues at this point. And, and then you have these societies and these people who are totally dedicated to making money and in the end also suffering and increasingly suffering from what we could call spiritual poverty. Yep, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and so, uh, Professor de, de, de Souza Santos, the, the final volume, volume 5, uh, is about the overall and theoretical findings of the project. So what are the, the, the key uh, intellectual and, and perhaps even human findings uh, of, of the project in your view? 
Well, the final is really the bridge between this project and the new project that I'm really starting. And basically, now I'm much more ambitious on the idea that the, the Western world is becoming smaller and smaller, in a way, and for centuries, the, the Western world has been teaching the world, and in a sense has been disabled to learn from the outside world. Mm -hmm. So what I'm uh, addressing in the last volume, and I'm starting a new project by, funded by the European Research Council, a very large project for the next five years, is what are the lessons that Europe and North America can learn from non-Western countries mm -hmm. for progressive politics for progressive knowledge. Of course, it's, this is not a project about romanticizing the non-Western world. There is much suffering, much despotism, and much corruption on the other side. But there is also much innovation. So my book is to sort out where are the areas and the conditions under which we can learn, while in fact up until now, the Western world has been teaching under colonialism and after colonialism, as if the rest of the world is underdeveloped and therefore has nothing to say. Mm -hmm. Things are changing and we have to start to learn from their experiences. So my book is about how to start learning from the global experience in this protected, up until now protected corner of the world, very small indeed, Europe and North America, that was really trained for centuries with colonialism just to teach and never to learn from the outside experience. So it's about re reversing the order to try to create a better order at the global level. That's the objective, Jamal. That's precisely.